God, give us a clear vision of the truth, faith in your power, and confident assurance of your love. Amen. This is what I have called my baseball sermon, gathered from a variety of sources. And it's not exactly about a game, but about people. I like this definition, author unknown. In this game of baseball, you throw the ball, you bat the ball, you catch the ball. Sometimes you win and sometimes you lose and sometimes it rains. The baseball season is just beginning. I've always found it to be a fascinating game in which you find so many fascinating people. And it testifies to the greatness of the game that some who are involved in it and have tarnished their own lives and have cast a shadow over the game have not ruined baseball itself. One of the best statements about baseball was made by a former president of Yale University, the late commissioner of baseball, A. Bartlett Geomati. He died several years ago at the age of 51. But he wrote, it breaks your heart. It was designed to break your heart. The game begins in the spring when everything else begins again and it blossoms in the summer, filling in the afternoons and the evenings. And then as soon as the chill rain comes, it stops and leaves you to face the fall alone. In the early 1950s, there was a marvelously appealing team of baseball players whom Branch Rickey once called my ferocious gentlemen. It has been said of them that they were outspoken, opinionated, bigoted, tolerant, black, white, open, passionate, in short, a fascinating mix of the most vigorous men. During four consecutive years, they entered the early autumn full of hope and enthusiasm at the head of their league, and each time they found catastrophe. Twice they lost the pennant in the ninth inning of the last game of the season. And twice they lost the World Series to their immortal rivals across the river in Yankee Stadium. But they lost with memorable style. And as Roger Kahn wrote in his book about this team, losing after great striving is the story of humankind who was born to sorrow, whose sweetest songs tell of saddest thought, and who do nothing in life so becomingly as leaving it. A whole continent was stunned by the high deeds and thwarted longings of Duke Snyder, Preacher Rowe, Pee Wee Reese, George Shotgun Shuba, Roy Campanella, Don Newcomb, and the rest. The team was from Brooklyn, and it was named the Dodgers until a legend died, and they moved to California. The setting of the book is baseball, but the story is of life and its meaning. To make that point, Roger Kahn wrote in the early 1970s, The Boys of Summer. It is a story about baseball, but it is not about a game. Of all the many books about baseball, it remains a classic. Kahn says it is about 
baseball playing men, not about baseball players. And he takes his theme from Dylan Thomas. I see the boys of summer in their ruin, lay the gold tidings barren, setting no store by the harvest. I love the boys of summer, giving no thought to the fall. Khan writes about several of the best known members of that team and all the various ways in which years after their athletic glory, they faced retirement. Unlike most people, he said, a baseball player confronts two deaths. First, he perishes as an athlete when he's 35 or 40, and then, like all the rest of us, he must face the final truth. There is something mystical and religious in the way that Khan covers the passage of time. And it reminds us of a text from the Old Testament Proverbs. The one who gathers in the summer is wise and who uses the present time while he is able is very wise indeed, for that time will pass away. The summer ends. Harvest will soon be over. Listen to how it happened to the boys of summer, bearing in mind that in those days there weren't the instant millionaires that there are today. Just by way of comparison, and this is about another sport, but I still remember when I was very young seeing a headline that Cliff Roach of the Truro Bearcats hockey team had signed a contract with Providence of the American Hockey League for $3,000. I think Willie Mays was the first to sign a contract for $100,000. How things have changed. But in those days, baseball players had to find something else for an income in the summer. And in that book, we see uh, Clem Labine, one of the first great relief pitchers of the early 50s, some years later, selling clothing in a Rhode Island store. When he was best, at his best, there was no one more dedicated. He could strike out the best of them and end the hopes of the finest Appointment, opponent. But 20 years, 30 years later, Clem Labine is lamenting over the days and months and seasons he was away from his family. He missed his growing son throughout his playing years, and Clement Walter Jr. never quite got over it. After several hassles with his father. He ran away and joined the U.S. Marines, a fine skier, a good athlete. But one night on a patrol in Vietnam, he stepped on a hidden mine. He lost his right leg, most of his courage, and almost his life. And Clem Labine says, a man can grow much older in one year than he did in the previous 20 and there was Carl Erskine, the pitcher, when he was through with baseball, or was it the other way around? He tried college at age 32, but it didn't work out. Then he turned to volunteer work at a home for retarded children, mainly because of a special little student named Jimmy, Jimmy Erskine, Carl's son, a mongoloid. That work became his life, and he sold insurance to help pay the bills. Then there was another pitcher by the name of Joe Black, a poor boy who worked his way up from the bottom. He ushered at Martin Luther King's funeral, and he knew the hatred associated with racism, but he kept on in that struggle which started so long ago. 
And then there was the great left-handed pitcher named Charles Rowe, who eventually became the sole proprietor in Preacher Rowe's supermarket in the Ozarks. His retirement was happy and well-adjusted, but when he tried to interest some young men in baseball, he concluded that all the fun had gone out of being a boy and he didn't know why. The shortstop on that team was Pee Wee Reese, and he turned to broadcasting. Carl Fiorello, the right fielder, became a hard hat construction worker. Duke Snyder lost his farm when he overstretched his investments. He later turned up as a broadcaster in Montreal. And Billy Cox, who used to tend third base with Grace and Ease was found tending bar in an American Legion in Newport, Pennsylvania. Roy Campanella ended up as a quadriplegic, the result of a car accident on an icy Long Island highway. Perhaps the biggest name of all was Jackie Robinson, who worked on behalf of many good causes, died at too early an age. You may remember, if you think back to the 1940s, how he broke in with the Montreal Royals in the International League before he was called up to the Dodgers as the first black player ever to play in the big leagues. And so Roger Kahn says, their whole world ends. Where Ebbets Field once stood, an apartment building was put up and within a few years was looking old and tawdry. Who will remember, asked Khan, who will ever remember those once mighty men? Where is the life that we have lost in the living? I remind you of these heroes here in the spring, at the start of another baseball season. Their message echoes the proverb, the one who gathers in the summer is wise. Fame and strength are fleeting. The days of our years are numbered. And even if they number 70, the word says they are soon end of their strength and sorrow. It will all soon fly away. Life is a gift to be treasured and lived in the moment, not yesterday, and not tomorrow. He who gathers in the summer is wise. Take those words with you and echo them from the rooftops. Tell them to the hard-driving workaholic who has no time for either leisure or family, who intends to race through life with little thought of anything or anyone else driving hard for the finish line. Tell him the story of Clem Labine. Tell him there is work to be done, but tell him what the work is. Tell him that his home and family needs him. Tell him that it takes hard work to sit and listen and try to encourage your teenager to talk. Tell him, as he frets over what he has to provide for them, that the most important thing that he can provide is himself. And tell him that in some circumstances a man can grow much older in a year than he did in the previous 20. And tell him that all his work in church and community isn't worth it if it means that he has no time left or earn energy for family and that life is the most important gift of all and that these years will pass so quickly. Tell it to those lives who have been wrecked and broken by discouraging illness or death or the loss of one they love. Tell them it takes time to pick up the pieces. Others have done it, and they can do it too. The road is long and steep, but you have a wonderful God to guide you. 
one who has promised that he will not fail or forsake us. Say it softly to them. And shout it out to the couple who can't get along anymore. There is the long, hard work of building a marriage that seems to be going to pieces. Step by step, prayer by prayer, take as much time as it took to destroy it. And who knows, you might find it once again. And tell it to the poor, aimless souls who have lost the meaning of life and think dark thoughts about ending it all. Tell them that over the next hill there is the plain and level road that will restore them. Tell them to stretch their vision wide out over the present into the future when the promise is true and all the debt of those times will be paid in full. And tell it to the children who have disappointed their parents, who squander away the hours, who are squandering the days and months and years as if youth was going to last forever. And tell them of the importance of speaking and showing your gratitude to those who love you. Someday you will understand. And someday may be too late, so do it now. And tell it to yourselves, all of you, that the first order of business to be settled is what you believe about God and life. The summer of life will go as it always does, and then winter will come. The seasons pass. Life will turn its corner into the winter. What will you do when the summer is shed? There are so many things I'd meant to try, so many contests I had hoped to win, but lo, the end approaches, just as I was thinking of preparing to begin. The one who gathers in the summer is wise. Wise is the one who stores up all the depth that is needed for the days when the summer disappears. For him in vain the envious seasons roll, who bears eternal summer in his soul. That is what Christ promises you. For beyond the present, when the boys of summer are gone and forgotten, there is a constancy, something that the seasons envy. For the seasons change, but eternal summer for the soul is yours, a gift from God himself in Jesus Christ, his son. The boys of summer were scattered by the fall. Some things change, but others remain unshaken and endure forever with the Lord. The one who gathers in the summer is wise indeed. Amen.